<sighs> no pressure at all. Thanks for having me. And uh, Leslie, I really look forward to uh, seeing how the Biennale turns out. So uh, I grew up in a little canyon in the middle of the city, in the middle of LA. Uh, there was a waterfall up the street, and we used to catch uh, little frogs in the creek that ran all the way down the street towards Hollywood Boulevard. That seemed totally normal to me. Uh, it's also probably where my love for old cars began. Uh, by the way, I really like maps, and this is an AIA LA architectural guide to, um, to the city from 1977. It seemed like a quiet place to live, but we were really in the middle of the city, and we were always out and about everywhere. My grandparents lived down by the marina, and my parents worked in Burbank and later near downtown. They had their own businesses. My dad was an engineer, and my mom's an artist, uh, so sometimes there was money, and sometimes there really wasn't. So even though we never moved, I went to seven different schools all over the city, bounced back and forth between public and private, but it gave me an interesting view of all different types of people, backgrounds, and parts of the city. We had this funky 1950s old house that was always breaking down, and my dad would have to fix it, so I learned how to re-roof a house, fix the plumbing, install skylights, replaster a pool, things like that. When I was about 15, my dad and I found this space inside one of the early um, artist colonies, uh, in LA. Uh, this is the old Paps Blue Ribbon Brewery, uh, started in, a, in the early 80s. There's about 500 artists that live there. He moved his office into one of, the, one of the units, and then soon after my mom moved her art studio there. It was really my first exposure to an adaptive reuse project, and I started to realize that you didn't need to always tear old buildings down. There's life in old buildings and a warmth that makes you feel good inherently. I went to architecture school at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and lived in this little 1903 craftsman bungalow, which was kind of a jolt to go from a large city full of culture and diversity to a fairly small town. But one of the best things about Cal Poly was that for your fourth year of design, they send you to study abroad. Obviously, I had to apply for it, uh, but I got to spend a year living in Florence and studying with Italian 70s radical architecture leaders from Super Studio and Johnny Pettina. And not only did I develop a love for food, language, and culture, but also for the way that they keep, repurpose, and honor their old buildings. I obviously never wanted to leave Europe, which really felt like Disneyland for architects. Uh, but I came back to San Luis to do my fifth year of design. I did an adaptive reuse conversion of this old flour mill in Chinatown near downtown LA. While I was doing research, I started reading LA Downtown, downtown News, which had a few articles about a local architecture office doing a lot of adaptive reuse downtown, Killer for Flamang Architects, and I started following their work. Everyone else in my class was getting jobs at big corporate offices before we even graduated, but I just wasn't ready for that. I remember traveling to Venice and to go to the Biennale for the first time, which completely blew my mind. That conversion of the old Arsenale into such an incredible exhibition space really had a big impact on me. Anyway, on my way back to Florence, I stopped by the Peggy Guggenheim collection and found all these kids my age working there. And I was like, how did you get this job? <laughs> Turned out they have a three-month internship for art history students to work there to learn about how museums really work from the inside. So while everyone else was getting very adult architecture jobs, I applied for this little three-month internship thinking it would just be a nice break before jumping into the real working world. After three months, they ended up hiring me to manage all of the interns, and I ended up staying there for almost two years. And let me tell you, when the Italian staff is yelling at you trying to figure out where all the interns are, you learn Italian really fast. <laughs> Overall, I had about 190 interns um, and made some really strong friendships from all over the world. I almost always go back every year for the opening week of the Biennale, and uh, I always have an invite to the American party because it's at the Guggenheim. So hopefully I'll see you there. And although that sounds romantic, this is what it really looks like to work in Venice. So after a while, I began to wonder, what was I doing there? And decided I needed to come back and give architecture a try. I came back and got my own space at the brewery and also inherited my great-grandparents, 1966 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. <laughs> before, but before I even had a chance to settle in, my mom had an art exhibit in her, in her space at the brewery and randomly Barbara Fulmang and Wade Killifer, who I had been following, uh, stopped by. It turned out that Barbara had gone to high school with my mom in the valley. 
and I ended up making friends with them, and they ended up hiring me, which was really my plan all along. <laughs> I was immediately thrown onto this adaptive reuse project, designed in 1913 by Parkinson and Bergstrom, as an office in the heart of the historic core. The building had been empty for 30 years, but we did a seismic upgrade and conversion to 200 condos. And really, on the first days that I started going to the construction site with our in-house CA manager, everyone looked at him and was like, is it bring your kid to work day? <laughs> but it was a true trial by fire and like epitome of learn by doing. During this time in 2006 and 7, downtown was really exploding. There were so many new restaurants and bars and buildings being uh, adaptively reused like this every day. I had this unofficial competition with a woman in my office, Karen. Uh, we would see each other in the office and be like, so, have you been to that new bar at Fifth and Spring yet? I'd be like, yeah, I went last week. <laughs> but then 2008 happened, and the adaptive reuse projects really all wrapped up, and no new work like this was coming in. We had major furloughs and layoffs in the office. I was going to buy a unit in this building, but then my uncle put my grandparents' house up for sale, and I bought that instead. It's a little 1940s wartime bungalow, uh, with a 70s pop top and sunken living room in the back. The maps are all mine, but that 1985 console TV was theirs. I couldn't get rid of it. The neighborhood used to be an avocado orchard, and I have the most amazing 100-year-old avocado tree covering the entire backyard. And that 1985 Jeep Grand Wagoneer is mine, too. Uh, at this time, the only work that we had really was skidrow housing and Type 5 apartments. We worked on a few of these, um, I worked on a few of these, both new construction and existing renovations, but this building, the Ford Hotel, uh, was designated by the LAPD as one of the most dangerous buildings on Skid Row, and they wouldn't let me inside just to take any measurements without an armed security guard. It was originally built in 1925 as a hotel for workers. Um, we did a seismic upgrade and combined hotel rooms in, uh, together to create 145 apartments for formerly unhoused people. It felt like we were doing something good for the community, but it was really difficult. During construction, we found a dead body shallowly buried under a slab on grade, and during two OACs, there were murders in the street right outside the construction trailer. Uh, around this time, Karin, who I had the downtown competition with, started trying to figure out how we could get more involved in downtown existing buildings again. We started brainstorming about what a potential new office only focused on adaptive reuse could look like. While we love and support historic preservation, it's really not what we wanted to focus on. We really wanted to try to be less precious, more approachable and engaging, more about rehabilitation and activation of the building and the neighborhood. We wanted to have a holistic approach to architecture and interiors, not have them be separated, and also figure out how we could be more engaging with and affecting the community, embracing the past but bringing it into today, where we were really thinking about the total environment. Now, the phrase total environment was already taken and too generic for a Google research. Karin's family is Swedish, but she's from New Jersey. So she came up with the word omgivning, which means it's a Swedish word that means the way that a space feels. Now, even though I protested, New Jersey powered through, and I have to admit, no one can pronounce it or spell it, but they do always remember it. Uh, it's the name of our office now. We started small in 2009 with just me working at our kitchen counter between her and her five-year-old son who was coloring his homework. Uh, and we steadily grown to almost 40 uh, before the pandemic, slimmed down to about 26 now. We started with small projects and put a lot of focus on Broadway in downtown LA, which at that time had a 10-year initiative by the council office called Bringing Back Broadway. We were part of the various committees from the beginning and helped write the Broadway Commercial Reuse Bulletin and the Broadway Sign Ordinance. This building, the Sparkle Factory, is a cute little building from 1914, really a mom and pop jewelry company with a lot of complicated code violations, which we worked through, cleaned up the building, restored the facade, converted it from light industrial or creative office. We also helped them get a facade lighting grant through the Bringing Back Broadway initiative. This uh, is the proper hotel, which we just finished after just a short eight years. Originally designed in 1926 by Curlett and Bielman as the Commercial Club, a private men's club. You can see Julia Morgan's Herald Examiner building in the foreground across the street. The club changed hands many times over the years and eventually be also became a YWCA and Job Corps training center. 
We converted the building to a 148 guest room hotel, added two floors and a rooftop pool, complied with the mandatory non-ductile concrete retrofit ordinance, nominated the building to become an LA Historic Cultural Monument, California Register and on the National Register, and got 20% historic tax credits from the National Park Service. We programmed, designed, and coordinated every inch of the building, salvaged and restored any historic fabric we found in the building, and worked with Kelly Wurstler Interiors on the finishes. Here's some detail shots of the restoration work that we did. We personally salvaged the original commercial club doorknobs, and I hid them at my desk for five years during construction until they were ready to be reinstalled. Here's some more interior detail shots of the typical rooms. This was an entry to the original grill room on the third floor, but every floor was completely different. We also found these original Babylonian plaster heads that had to be removed in order to do the seismic work. I also kept them at my desk for five years, and I don't know what happened when I wasn't looking. But they have been safely reinstalled in the building in their original locations, now overlooking someone's hotel bed. Totally not creepy. <laughs> One of the biggest early discussions we had with the client was about this original pool on the seventh floor, right in the middle of the building. They thought that no one would want to use this pool, uh, especially if we were doing a rooftop pool. So they wanted to demo it to create no more rooms. We convinced them that if we kept the pool, we could turn it into an amazing private suite so someone could have a full-size pool in the living room of their hotel. <laughs> it turned out pretty well. And we always joked that it would have to be someone like Beyonce that would rent a room like this. Well, guess what? During Grammy week, that's exactly who rented the room. <laughs> Here's an overall shot of the new rooftop restaurant, bar and pool, and the original blade sign that we rehabilitated. This building in East Hollywood was originally designed in 1963 by Paul Williams for the Women's Assistance League as their headquarters. And there's my Oldsmobile in the front again. <laughs> they were the first charity organization to come up with the concept to hold fancy parties and charge a small fee for entry into, in order to raise money. In the 90s, they acquired most of the rest of the block and they built an underground parking garage and a two-story family resource center above, which unfortunately did not age well. We collaborated with Madrid-based architect Selgas Cano to develop a plan to remove the 90s building and build 75 oval-shaped bungalows on top of the underground parking lot, all sunken within an incredibly lush garden for London-based co-working space second home. These spaces were originally used by the ladies for events, and now it's an incredible place to work both indoor and outdoor, really great for pandemic working. We collaborated with them to develop ways to divide up historic spaces like this original main entry lobby with plexiglass walls in order to create three meeting rooms while still maintaining the whole original volume of the space. Second Home also holds their own private events, which is where I first met Francis. Here's a taste of what it's like to work in the bungalows. It really feels like you're sunken in this urban jungle. We also helped them through a two-year process to use CLT as a roof diaphragm for the first time in the city of LA. Now I'm gonna to switch to something a little more personal. <laughs> I told you that I really love LA old and, and old buildings, but I also really love the Hollywood Bowl. I made this for Halloween in 2019, including the original reflecting pool that used to be there. <laughs> but during the pandemic, all Hollywood Bowl concerts were of course canceled so I had a few little outdoor concerts where we put an iPad in the costume and had a picnic with friends. You can see in the middle we're having a Dolly Parton concert because why wouldn't we? One day we got really antsy and danced in the middle of the street because no one was driving anywhere anyway. So this ended up on Instagram and the Hollywood Bowl found it and then commissioned me to make 10 more so they could give them out as prizes trying to get people to come to their restaurant to get takeout. Here are some current projects I'm working on. Also designed in 1926 by Curlett and Beelman, same as the proper hotel. This is the Elks Lodge 99 in MacArthur Park. My great-grandfather was an elk in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and he used to come out to visit my grandmother in LA when she was studying music at USC. He would stay here and sneak her in to play the organ because of course it was another men's club. The Elks eventually sold the building and it became a hotel in the 50s, then later a famous nightclub called Power Tools in the 80s. It's been used in so many films for weddings and many KCRW concerts and events. 
But the building was actually very unsafe with some incomplete structural work that happened in the early 2000s, which made the building top heavy and more dangerous than it was before, plus many code uh, and fire violations. We ended up doing a full seismic upgrade to comply with the mandatory non-ductile concrete retrofit ordinance and soft story retrofit ordinance, and also historic tax credit project. Uh, all the original ballroom and event spaces will be restored, and on the upper floors, we're building 41 long-term stay hotel rooms. I'm almost done. The next thing I'll show you is this 1914 little unreinforced masonry building uh, in the Arts District. It was another one of these traveling worker hotels. Um, this area used to have a big manufacturing um, component, so it's surrounded by industrial warehouses. It's owned by an artist couple that has been holding incredibly engaging site-specific art installations throughout the entire building called Art at the Rendon. Their vision was to, um, uh, the design that they came to us was a complete facadectomy with only two walls of the original building left and a new glass tower coming out of the middle of it. Their vision was to build an addition to the hotel and turn it into a three to four star hotel room, really focused on art with a gallery space throughout, an artist in residence program, and of course a restaurant bar. We could tell that Ralph and Maria, the owners, really loved the old building, but were resigned to the fact that they'd have to lose it. After we went to one of their installation events, which you see on the right, uh, they, had a very different, they had a different performance artist do whatever they want inside every hotel room, and you could just wander throughout the whole building. We just knew it didn't feel right to tear down the building. We ended up proposing a new tower just in the tiny parking lot that's behind the building, partially cantilevering over the existing building and partially cantilevering over the sidewalk in order to meet the guest room count that they needed. We also proposed using more industrial materials like CMU for the exterior walls of the tower, basically things that are more common in the Arts District warehouses that would make the building a little less precious and more ready for the building to act as an artist canvas. Ralph and Maria and the neighborhood stakeholders all really love this idea and we're submitting to plan check in a couple weeks. The last professional thing I'll show you is this. We've been trying, as I'm giving, to buy a building for over 10 years, but our eyes were always bigger than our budget. But we finally were able to buy this little 1959 building in Chinatown designed by Gilbert Leong, the first Chinese American to graduate from USC in architecture. After working for Paul Williams after World War II, he started his own practice and built a lot of the buildings in Chinatown. It has retail downstairs and six apartment upstairs. We're keeping the apartment tenants and converting the ground floor to our own version of a co-working space. We're currently un under construction and acting as our own GC, which you can imagine is really fun. It's going to be called SUM, which is a Swedish word for seam, or the threading of things together. Since we're not back in the office full time and we really don't intend to be, we took a deep look at what we really need and we realized that what we really need is a gathering space a place for us to meet with each other or with clients, uh, and with just a handful of desks that could be shared. We also realized that we don't really need this space for all 26 of us every day of the week, and that we could share our resources with other people we know in the building environment industry. So we're currently looking for tenants to share this space, if anyone knows anyone in the design world. <laughs> all right, lastly, I told you that I really like maps. I have an architect friend that was trying to make some custom tile with a tile company and got frustrated and decided to start her own tile company. She then taught me how to make tile and now I'm very slowly making a tile map of every neighborhood in LA County. <laughs> if, if and when I ever finish it, I think it's gonna become an outdoor table and based on the scale I accidentally chose, it's gonna be about 10 feet square. <laughs> okay, that's it, thank you very much.